Joining me today are Dr. Lila Noctegal, a world-renowned expert on menopause, and her daughter, Dr. Margaret Noctegal, who is a reproductive endocrinologist and also an expert on menopause and a frequent guest on Age Better Podcast. So welcome back, Dr. Lila, Dr. Margaret. Thank Thank you, Barbara. Dr. Margaret. New research has come out in recent years about how hot flashes, a common symptom of perimenopause and menopause, which can actually linger for many, many years, too many years for many women, are not just annoying, but they can impact your health in very serious ways. So please, Dr. Margaret, explain what is a hot flash and why do you think women need to spend more time focusing on them? Great, great question. So just as you mentioned, hot flushes are one of the most common symptoms that occurs in perimenopause and particularly menopause. And we know that a hot flush, which can also be be called hot flashes, is basically the feeling of being extremely warm. Some people, it starts at the head and works down to the toes, sometimes the other direction. You can get red and sweating and it lasts for a short period of time and then it is gone. And some individuals in menopause could get up to 20, 30 hot flushes a day, some fewer than that. And this can, although the majority of people, it lasts for about five years, it can last as long as 20 and even 30 years after menopause. Why does a hot flush happen? A hot flush comes because we now we know that estrogen actually keeps part of the brain suppressed. And that part of the brain is called the part of the brain that controls the thermoregulatory zone. So that means that this part of the brain is keeping us comfortable at a nice temperature. And when a person is deprived of estrogen, this part of the brain starts firing. And instead of being comfortable at this wide range, that range narrows. And so you're hot at a lower temperature and you're actually cold at a higher temperature. So both extremes can happen, shivering and sweating. We now know that that part of the brain, there are certain neurons called candy neurons. And One of those is kispeptin, another one is neurokinin-3, and another one is dynorphin. The great thing and some novel approaches now is though we can actually modulate those candy neurons and mitigate or lessen or even eliminate hot flushes without using estrogen. But estrogen is uh, what is keeping these at bay. So that's what a hot flush is. But the second part of the question that you asked me is why would we wanna treat it? Well, number one, you wanna treat it because it can be very uncomfortable. It can keep you up at night and we know that lack of sleep can be a serious problem. It's uncomfortable because it may interfere with your entire day's activity. You may be lecturing, you may be at a big meeting, you may even just be at your desk. Whatever you are, these are not comfortable. But in addition, it's very interesting that we have found, um, multiple studies have shown that increased hot flushes, the more hot flushes we have, an increase in cardiovascular disease and an increase in dementia. Now, we do not know that one causes the other, but it certainly is interesting that an increase, there's an association. The more hot flushes, the more cardiovascular disease, and the more dementia. So treating it, we would imagine, would hopefully be able to decrease cardiovascular disease and decrease dementia. Thank you. And Dr. Lila, you recently gave a talk at the American College of Physicians annual meeting about new treatments to manage these hot flashes that clearly, Dr. Margaret, thank you for explaining that to us, need to be treated. Um, Please talk us through all the key options that are available to women at this time. Well, for very many years, we knew that we needed estrogen to stop the hot flashes, even way before we knew about the candy neurons and the fact that estrogen is suppressing them. We knew replacing estrogen in the menopausal woman would uh, treat those hot flashes and could. 
And we have to say, even with all the new information we have, we still feel that for the menopausal woman, when you want to stop the hot flashes, the gold standard is still estrogen. But we now have some very good long-term results from the WHI. And you remember that the WHI, I'm sure the women listening remember that that was over 20 years ago and uh, made it sound like estrogen was a negative. Well, following women for all these years, it turned out that estrogen was not a negative. When we look at long-term risks and benefits, the benefits of estrogen far outweigh the risks. <clears throat> Sorry. But the real problem was the progestin. So women with a uterus who have to take a progestin along with estrogen to protect their lining of the uterus from hyperproliferation, which we know for a very long time, but the progestin was the bad part. And the good news is we now have a great substitute for progestin. It's called basodoxaphene, and it's only available in combination with an estrogen in a new drug, fairly new drug that's been approved by the FDA. And this combination is really working very well, gives you the estrogen, but protects the lining of the uterus without the negatives of progestin. So that's one new drug that I talked about to the internists who are finally getting around to treating menopausal women. And But the other interesting fact is once we knew about the candy neurons that Margaret talked about, particularly the most active one in upsetting the whole balance of temperature called neurokinin, they were able to develop an antigen to the neurokinin, an actual suppressor specifically of the neurokinin receptor. And it works. And it has gone through all the phase one, two, and three studies. And almost a year ago, it was approved by the FDA, and it's now on the market. Its name is Feslanatant, and it's marketed as Vioza. I think you all heard Vioza because uh, the company is advertising quite a lot because they want to get the word out that there is an approved non-hormonal treatment for hot flushes. It doesn't do any of the other good things that estrogen does, uh, such as treat bone strength or, um, or treat vaginal dryness, but it does really fix hot flashes, decreases their number, decreases their intensity and and works very well but and it also doesn't have any of the negatives of estrogen doesn't stimulate the endometrium at all doesn't cause bleeding uh, and it is available it's nice to have this choice that's wonderful and of course as dr margaret said earlier, um, treating hot flashes in partnership with your healthcare provider, of course, is really a very important uh, thing for women to do, certainly to have that conversation. Dr. Lila, what is the best time? A lot of women want to know this best time to start hormone therapy. And uh, many women want to know if they can continue to stay on hormone therapy if they've been on it for a while, maybe somebody who's uh, 65 or 70. I mean, you know, is there a time frame here? What do you say? Yes, there's definitely, definitely a time frame. So starting, I don't think you ever should start hormone therapy, what we call replacement therapy, uh, before the actual menopause. But I don't think you have to wait for the definition of menopause, which is a year without menstruating. If you're having symptoms and you're two months without a menstrual period, 
there are tests, blood tests that would show you that you're in real menopause. And with a lot of the new information, particularly about preventing dementia, which we all want to do, whatever we can do, uh, the sooner into menopause you start, the better. So that's one point. But the other point that you're bringing up is how long can you stay? And, um, you know, we are saying do not start if you're more than 10 years after your last menstrual. And that's for a very good reason, because women that far away from making estrogen uh, have a greater incidence of forming plaque. And if they have plaque in their arteries, estrogen might make uh, unstable plaque and it could travel. So that's when you get the risk of, say, a stroke. Mm -hmm. But when you're before 10 years, you don't. Usually estrogen is such a good protector of making plaque that these women are safe. Mm -hmm. The other issue is we say over 60, for the same reason, don't start estrogen. But if you started estrogen when you were 54 or 55 because you were recently menopausal, you can stay on it over 60 because the plaque formation is prevented. And so I, I mean, if you're still symptomatic, that really has to be reevaluated at least once a year mm -hmm. to see if you still need it, to see if you can actually lower your dose now that you're older. And that's what we do when you go. But as Dr. Margaret said, there are women who still have hot flushes, at 75, at 80, and uh, when you go off medication, we put them right back on medication. Now, is and this a, is this time frame also true for the newer medications that are non-estrogen medications? That's an yeah. awfully good question, but we don't know the answer mm -hmm. to that because so far the studies have only been as long as almost four years of study. Mm -hmm. But that is definitely not enough to know that. Mm -hmm. I would so say... So stay tuned on that. <laughs> stay tuned on that, but they do seem very safe. It's not recommended if you have abnormal liver function tests, probably not to start any drug, but this is one that you don't start. But once you're on it, we do test for liver function at three months, six months, and nine months. But once you have no change in your liver function after nine months, it's you can go on with it. It's not going to be a problem. And we'll see, but I think that long-term use of this will be fine. Oh, that's, that's wonderful and very good news, I think, for a lot of people out there who are considering this new medication, but also who are currently on HT and are wondering if it's okay to stay on. So, so I think that the real message for, for this is that women should really have this discussion with their trusted healthcare provider and talk about the options and see if they are a, a candidate for yes. hormone therapy, and if not, let's explore the other options that are out there. Um, because as, which is like our mantra, Dr. Margo, right. whenever you're on, right? No, Don't, I, no I, woman I, should ever suffer. Well, I think that's the big thing, is that since there is a window, as you said, a window of opportunity, is that have that conversation sooner rather than later. So right at the time of menopause, or even a little bit before, um, to have the conversation so that you're well-informed and ready to make that type of decision when the time comes. And, you know, you might not know at that time what your symptoms are going to be. So you may have a very different feeling about it. And I have this conversation with patients all the time. And we go through all the advantages and the disadvantages, not only in general, but also as it pertains to that particular individual. Because everyone's coming in with a different set of pre-existing conditions, such as their lipid level, how, what is their cholesterol like? What is their family history? Uh, what's their family history of bone loss? Do they themselves have bone loss? Have they had a very sedentary life? Are they an exerciser? 
So all of these things are going to weigh into our decision. What's the um, cancer history, et cetera. So one is having that conversation, going over the pluses and the minuses as early as possible, because just as, as we have discussed, you really, if you're going to start, you want to start as soon as possible. And certainly not, you know, within the first five years would be ideal, um, not beyond 10 years and lower than the age of 60. But then you could stay on. We're not putting a time limit as to how long you have to stay on. You just keep reevaluating and you can stay on. Sometimes that um, new information, which is start within 10 years or before age 60, gets confused. And patients as well as, as doctors might think, oh, as soon as I turn 60, I have to go off my estrogen. That's not true. You don't turn 60 and have to go off. That might be only three years that you've been on. Um, you're going to reevaluate, see if it's still important. You might want to start lowering the dose at that time and see if your symptoms come back. If you do, you can go back up in the dose. But, um, but the other conversation is also, if you are going to be on hormone therapy, what type are you going to go on a patch? Are you going to go on a pill, a cream, a gel, et cetera? So there's lots of decisions to discuss and think about and try and options to change. But just as you said, the important thing is to um, not to start when it's beyond 10 years. So the four indications that the FDA approves of is to protect you from bone loss. Mm -hmm. They don't say treatment of osteoporosis, but they say mm -hmm. protection of bone loss. To protect you from bone loss. I think it's very important that you do bring it up, and I know you're very interested in the bone issue, is that the first three years after menopause, will be the greatest percentage of bone loss any woman will have. We know that. So whether she loses a lot over her lifetime or she loses very little over her lifetime, the greatest percentage of that loss will be the first three years after menopause. So I believe, and I think at least for that early time, it's the most important drug to protect your bone. And I think you're right that um, internists haven't been looking at that. And I think it was the WHI that threw them off. They used to use it right away. And it is the best drug for bone protection early post-menopause, even if for some reason, you don't want to continue it after the first couple of years. You might change to a different product for your bone. And we do have a lot of choice there. But right. That's it's true. It's certainly the best treatment for early on. For early on. Menopause. But it just seems to me that, and I hear this from so many women, that the whole idea of, of uh, the discussion around hormone therapy comes up really more when a woman is experiencing the hot flashes and the more common Absolutely. symptoms. It doesn't, it doesn't really come up if it's like mm -hmm. you, you feel great, you know, no mm -hmm. hot flashes are very few, right. but yet your bones are going to get weaker. And that just doesn't seem to be a focus. And that's really heartbreaking to me because you're right. I do focus on bone health a great deal. And we know the statistics around bone health. So uh, I feel like I'm almost on a mission to get more, you know, people in the medical community as well as women to speak up for themselves and advocate for themselves when they're having these discussions. Like, no, you know, my hot flashes are pretty manageable, um, but I'm worried about my bones. Right. Those well, are the discussions I think women should have more of. I have to say it is in increasing. And okay. I, do, I do notice on a day-to-day -day basis that I see more patients coming in wanting to talk about hormone therapy than I have in the past. So I think there is an increased awareness. And with you talking about it all the time, more people will also request it. That's great. Good news. Good news all around. Well, Dr. Lila, Dr. Margaret, you are both incredible. I so appreciate your spending time with me again um, out of your very, very busy days and busy schedule. So, but before we let you go, can you please share what you think are three key takeaways you really want the Age Better audience to remember from this talk today? Um, well, for number one, first of all, Thank you for having us. Always fun to be here with you. Um, and we love getting to be together. So that's, that's 
Um, so that's fun. So I think the big things are individualized care and uh, really to pay attention to yourself and what your needs, wishes, goals of treatment are. I think that just as we described that there are many options now, both hormonal and non-hormonal for hot flushes and that uh, it doesn't have to be a hormonal option. And that if you are gonna start hormone therapy, that there is that window that you wanna start younger than age 60 within 10 years of menopause and to continually to reevaluate. That's two, you have one? I thought you gave three. Did I give three? <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> they were perfect. Uh, thank you both so, so very much. And, and everyone, please remember next week, we're going to have an episode focused on supplements, the ones that we think you might want to consider once you're in midlife, and then those that you should just say, nah, I think I'm going to walk away from those and save a little money. Okay? So we're going to take a deep dive into that. Thank you all again for listening. Dr. Lila, Dr. Dr. Margaret, thank you so much. Bye, Barbara. Bye.